This is not necessarily a sermon. It's just something we've done the last few years on the first Sunday of the new year. Just kind of backtrack and remind us um, you know, who we are as a church and what we're all about. Um, it was uh, July of 2007 uh, when we, as a church, uh, started meeting once again. Now, the, for those of you who don't know this or you're visiting with us today, uh, this church originally constituted in 1969, January of 1969, and uh, Dr. Davis was the pastor. Peggy Davis was the first, was the very first first lady. So you know she's the first lady, Peggy. You're really the first lady, not, uh, not, uh, not Misty. And uh, the first service was held in uh, Eric Boucher's garage, and Eric was only what one or two years old, one year old at the time. So he led the music and and uh, <laughs> was in charge of the nursery uh, in, uh, in his garage down in uh, down Hillsborough Row. What was the name of the subdivision? Brookside. Brookside Drive. It's an older subdivision um, past, uh, well, just past Philstone Farms uh, a little bit. And, uh, and then uh, the church went through some things. We had, they had a piece of property in a building over on Del Rio Pike, just, just across, across from here. In 1989, Misty and I came uh, right out of college, 23 years old, and uh, was there for 14 years and then felt called to Arkansas in 2003. And uh, during that, the next few years, this church went through some struggles and actually voted to close, uh, contacted me uh, in Arkansas about what to do, how do you close a church, and then through a process way too long to talk about now, it was decided in 2007 to come back and restart. And at that time, uh, the conversation that I had with God was, if you want me to go back to Franklin, we got to have a different type of church. We don't need the same type of church that we had been doing and that um, every other church in, uh, in Franklin is, is doing. In my own mind, it was Franklin doesn't need another um, Bill Hybels, Willow Creek, uh, Sinker Sensitive, Purpose Driven, Rick Warren Church. Um, that may not mean anything to you, but that means something to me. And, um, um, and that's what we had done. And so through a long, long process, God have placed it on my heart about a church that has more of a social awareness and really reaching out to the community uh, and working with people on the margins. And so in uh, July 2007, we came back, had a service on Sunday evening in a Sunday school classroom at Christ Community Church. Some of you were there, most of you were not uh, there. And, uh, and then in March of 2008, we came over to uh, Johnson and we picked Johnson out on purpose because of its relationship uh, to the hard bargaining community and, uh, and then we started uh, doing things that uh, are a little bit different, like sitting around tables. Um, I can remember the first time we talked about sitting around tables. We didn't have tables. We just set up one Sunday chairs in a circle with no table. And, and uh, there was a, a family that visited that first time. They never came back. <laughs> there was something very vulnerable about sitting in a circle with, uh, with no table, huh? They were at your table, which is or your non-table. And then we experimented with the tables, liked it so much, we ended up getting the tables, and uh, now it's somewhat normal to, uh, if I go to a, another church and they don't have tables, I'm like, what's wrong with them? Where, where am I going to put my coffee? Um, and, uh, uh, but anyway, so it's kind of been interesting to think back uh, over some things. So we reconstituted uh, and uh, became an elder-led church instead of a, a congregational uh, church. Um, we sold property. A uh, decision was made to invest the resources into people instead of buildings. Uh, you know, God may one day provide us with a permanent space, but we're in no hurry for that because we never want to be a, in a position as a church where we can't help somebody because we have a mortgage to pay or we have our own light bills to pay. We never want to put ourselves in that, uh, in that uh, position. There's a church in the county, I'm not going to tell you which one, but I was talking to the pastor one day, and their mortgage on all their property is 80000 a month. Uh, and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> That's unimaginable to me. Uh, but, uh, uh, but anyway, so, so we made a decision to, uh, to try things a little bit different. And so a few years ago, we started uh, our main ministry, maybe our only ministry, frankly, community development, which is where the community center and the group home and the homeless shelter and all those things uh, kind of um, uh, come into play. And it's been an interesting journey over uh, 12 years. Over the last few years, we've seen a decline as far as uh, Sunday morning attendance goes. I think... A lot of that's due to we had some key families move, we've had some key deaths, um, and uh, when you're a small church and, uh, and you have one or two families move, as far as I know, no one's left mad, they've just moved out of state, 
um, then, it, it, then it, affects, uh, uh, it affects you, it affects that a little bit. And so the challenge for 2019 up front is everybody needs to bring somebody with you to church. All right, that's the challenge, okay? Uh, let's, uh, let's, there are people out there, now if they go to another church, don't bring them. They need to stay at their church. That's not what we're about. Um, but if you know people who are struggling, uh, who maybe they're burnt out on church, and they're just looking for something different and something uh, that you receive here, uh, then uh, please, you know, uh, if they don't fit in anywhere else, they'll fit in here. Uh, so, uh, uh, and so, you know, just that's kind of the overall challenge to, uh, to, to look at, at things that way. But when we reconstituted and when we set out our vision, and this is where I hope you got your newsletter, I'm just going to walk through some things that maybe you don't read or you haven't read it in a long time, but this is in our newsletter uh, every week. Um, you can see at the top it says, this is our vision as a church, enabling Middle Tennesseans to experience authentic relationships with God and each other by establishing an Acts 2 biblical community. Recently I walked through an, uh, with a nonprofit helping them um, redefine their vision and so forth, and they brought in an expert, and uh, we were talking about what should our vision statement be, and, and the expert said, you know, ask different people where they work and what their vision statement is, and nobody knew. And when he asked me as a church what our vision statement is, surprisingly, I couldn't believe I remembered it offhand, I spouted that out real quick, and the expert was speechless. He said, you're one of the first people, especially church, that even the pastor would know what to say when I asked them uh, that question. And so that has not changed. Now, here's what it says in Acts 2, okay? Acts 2, verse 42. This is the Acts 2 idea of an Acts 2 fellowship. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship of the breaking of bread and prayer. And so we do communion every week because of, uh, really because of this. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. And so the church saw miracles and we've seen that in our midst. We've seen healings. We've seen uh, things that you cannot explain except that, um, uh, that God did something uh, there. And so we're thankful for that. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Think about that. Uh, our church helps whenever we can with whatever we can. And uh, it's, I tell people it's a fine line between helping people and enabling people. You know, there's always that, that tension, um, but uh, it's, it's not a straight line. It's, it's more like... <laughs> It's more like that when you're trying to, how, how can we best help people without enabling them? What, how do we help? What's the best way to help? But our church, I think, bends over backwards trying to do that. Every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. So they broke bread in their homes and ate together. This whole idea of community with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Um, as a church, I was telling even the Sunday school class this morning at West Franklin that Probably as a church, we've helped other churches grow more than we've helped our own. Um, you know, uh, our, someone has prophesied over our church that we'd be a place where people would come for healing, and then once they get healed, they move on. <laughs> and that's aggravating, but, uh, but that's the way it is. We've had numerous people who have been involved in different types of ministries in the church and without the church who come, and in my conversations with them, they're, they're, they're burnt out, they're going through difficulties, and they just need a place to come and to sit and to heal and they receive that here, and now they're in ministry uh, all over, literally all over the world. Uh, there are people who will periodically contact me who at one time or another uh, were at this church, and now they're serving the Lord in, um, um, in different places. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. I, sometimes I wish they'd hang around a little longer, but um, if, that's God, if that's how God wants to add to his church by using us as a healing place for people to come and then leave, that's, that's okay with us. Um, and so our church is far bigger than what you see here. Um, somebody described, to, described my church to me this way. They said, your footprint is a whole lot bigger than your foot. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's a good way to say it. And then, of course, it's kind of an odd thing that after all these years, there's a lot of things that we're doing that people in the community can't understand how a church can do those things. And, th and they're... And they're grateful and they call me and, and all that kind of stuff and, and they're impressed by what our church is doing but then I'm like yeah but you know what there was this guy in 1969 who had a vision for the church to be doing what we're doing right Peg? 
there was a homeless shelter in downtown Franklin in the 70s that Dr. Davis started. And now here we are trying our best to get a shelter. <laughs> Not original with me. It's what this church, it's been in the DNA of this church from the very beginning to reach out and to help others. I don't mean to embarrass her, but Peggy would tell you stories of people that Dr. Davis brought home who she'd have to go lock herself in the bedroom. <laughs> Not so sure about these people, right? <laughs> you know, but Dr. Davis's heart to reach out. <laughs> you know, Dr. Davis and Missy said, don't you ever do that to me. So, um, but uh, just this, the DNA of this church, even though we reconstituted in 2007, was really an attempt to go back to what was originally part of this church uh, from that. And it's an, to enable people to have this authentic relationship with God and each other. That's why we're a community church. It really is about each other and with God. By establishing this Acts 2 community, which is where the social things that we do come into play. And so on your newsletter then, you have uh, kind of what we des describe as our values. Um, we value community. Uh, Community is our middle name. I got Franklin Community Church, middle name. Did you get, catch that? Um, and it means more than just that we live in the same area. It means that we try to establish uh, a place, a safe place where we care for each other. And you have a thing on your table that you probably hadn't read in a long time, if ever, about why we sit around table. It fits with our idea of community, just having a cup of coffee and sitting around a table and talking with each other. Um, and, so, and so community is important to us. We value unity. Um, and unity is best seen in diversity, which is also what we value. doesn't mean that we all act alike, talk alike, but we all are willing to work together uh, regardless of our economic background, our educational background, our racial background. All those kind of things don't matter. Uh, we are uh, the body of Christ, and we want a church that kind of reflects the community that we live in as well. And so, and so we value this unity uh, within our diversity. I mean, you know, we're all um, coming at this from totally different perspective. Some people have been in church all their life, some haven't, some are coming from other uh, religious groups, some from other countries uh, even, and uh, you know there's, there's a lot of different ways that churches worship, and, uh, but yet we're trying to come together uh, with this uh, diversity and just work together, uh, not trying to change each other, but uh, to accept one another where we come from and where we're at and then walk together uh, for whatever the next step may be. We value creativity. Uh, we're willing to try anything at least once, sometimes over and over again. Um, uh, but also creativity allows us to whatever it is that you would like to do. Uh, you know, I've had a long, we haven't seen this yet, but I have a long passion to where our church is more active even in the arts where people are bringing uh, paintings that they've painted and, and poems that they've written and, and uh, dances, you know, we've had, we've experiments with that, bringing in dance groups, worship dance, and all those different things, just to, to show creativity, creativity and mission, where uh, so much of our resources go to serving other people, and, and with the group home, and, and uh, the community center, and, and uh, all those different kinds of things. That's all part of creative. How can we be a different church? How can we be unique? And if there's one thing you can say about Franklin Community Church is, we are unique. Not sure if there's another church uh, in our city of any that's doing things exactly the same way we are, and that's that's how it should be. Why would we want? I mean, you know, uh, there are plenty of good churches around here uh, that are doing things that are pretty much every you know kind of like all the other churches. And uh, but you know, where is our unique? I, I've told people this that when I left in tw when I left in 2003 to go to, to Arkansas to pastor a church, um, and then the church kind of went through some struggles, and the church closed. I don't mean this in a bad way, but people in the city probably didn't even know that Franklin community, that the church was struggling and that the church had closed, because there was so many churches in Franklin, right? Nobody really cared. Um, and this is to God be the glory, this is not about us, but I'm telling you, the city would miss our church if, if we were here. They would miss us. Churches call me and, hey, I got this going on. How can we help here? What can we do here? You know, it's just, uh, uh, it really is amazing. It, you know, I wish you could 
just get a camera and follow me one week and see all the different things that happen uh, during the week that have something to do with our church uh, being out in, in the community. I talked to two reporters this week um, who were doing stories on, on poverty and, and, um, um, and you know, a paper from Chattanooga called about the fuller story uh, that, that we're involved in. And, and um, it's just, you know, uh, people, we, we have our place in the city. That's an important place. Uh, in the city, and I'm thankful, uh, thankful to God uh, for that. And so creativity and then authenticity is really, really, not that one is more important than the other, but one thing that we stress around here is, look, we, this is just who we are, this authentic relationship with Christ. None of us are perfect, including your pastor. Um, we all have our own hang-ups. We all have our own problems, but let's follow God and let's worship Him and let's be real about it and not be judgmental. Uh, about other people and what they're going through because we all have our own things that we're going through. And so authenticity, I love it when people uh, will say, you know, man, I visited your church, but what, what I found there was that, man, that was a, it was just real. Um, you know, not sure always what they mean by that, but I take it as a compliment. It was just, you know, there was just something different there. And, uh, um, and so that's kind of, you know, it's important that we look at these things every year to remind us that, look, this is why we do what we do um, it's coming from this, everything from sitting around tables uh, to meeting in a school, all have a purpose. There, there, it's an intentionality uh, behind it. We made intentional decisions to do the things that we are doing and to be part of what it is that we're a part of, um, believing that this is what God has called us as a church to be. And uh, we pray that you see uh, the importance of this and that you want to continue to be involved um, in, uh, in what we're doing as a church. And so, and then, you know, we describe our mission and we use the acrostic of we want to be real, building on that idea of authenticity. And so we have a desire to reach our community for Christ. Uh, we believe strongly uh, in, uh, that there's a heaven and there's a hell and that people have to make that profession of faith, uh, ask forgiveness of their sins. Um, and so we want to reach our community for Christ and through, uh, through the good deeds, but ultimately we do all this to bring glory to God and uh, to let people know that Jesus loves them and that there's a better way. Um, and so, and then equip one another for ministry. Uh, you know, all of us have a, have a place to do. We don't have a lot of ministries through our church. Franklin Community Development is about it. Uh, but my idea of equipping people for ministry is that when you go throughout your week, uh, wherever it is that you work or go to school or in your neighborhood, what are you doing there? How have I equipped you there uh, to show the love of Christ there? I'm not really concerned about having people out in the parking lot showing you where to park. Uh, I know how to park. I go to the mall and nobody shows me where to park. You know, I mean, I know how to park my car. But do you know how to follow Christ Monday at 2 o'clock when you're at work and people are stressed and you're stressed? How are you equipped to do ministry there? Does that make sense? You know, that's, what is it there? And so our ministries are wherever you are, wherever you're working, you know. When you go to your neighbor's house and help them cut the grass or help them do something, you know, I tell people oftentimes, um, you know, instead of us starting a ministry, if you care about the environment, get involved in the Harpeth River watershed and, and go on a Sunday in the river and help people clean out the river. You know, what? Can't, no, go. If that's when they're doing it, go and help them. And when you're talking to people and they're asking, why did you come out here today to clean the river? Say, well, because this is what God has called me to do. This is how I am serving God, because he cares about this. And my church has taught me to care about this as well, you see. So, so equipping you for ministry is getting you to, to wherever it is, whatever you're doing, how can God use you there? And then if you want to get plugged in into a nonprofit or something, we've got plenty of, uh, I, plenty of avenues to, to put you in things that are not part of our church, but other, uh, other organizations uh, from that. But equip you for ministry. Um, adore God through worship, and I love our worship. I love our praise team. Um, I love what they bring. Um, it's really uh, incredible to me that God has blessed us with the musicians that he has. Uh, you know, again, I would like to expand worship to include other parts of the arts besides music, but I'm so, so thankful for uh, the praise team and, and uh, how they've helped us as a church come and worship the Lord uh, every week through worship and through communion and through all of that. And then love each other unconditionally and learning God's word. And, uh, you know, loving each other unconditionally, if you really mean that, that'll stretch your idea of grace oftentimes, will it not? <laughs> you know, uh, because all of us 
are sinners, um, and all of us have different hang-ups from that. So that's kind of who we are, and, and, and those kind of things haven't changed. Um, you know, we, that's who we strive to be uh, from that. Um, on the back, there's a few other things I want us to look at this morning. Um, on the back every week, we have the ABCs of salvation, and so, you know, just to stress the importance of this personal relationship with Christ that we have to have in the sinner's prayer. Some additions, some things that are not, haven't been in the previous newsletters every week, but I added as I was thinking about this year, because um, I think we need to know these things as a church. Two important biblical passages that help explain our church's philosophy are Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, and Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Because of time, I won't read those. I encourage you to read those, um, but I'll tell you what they say. Matthew chapter 4 is really the job description of the, of the Messiah. It's when Jesus returns to his hometown synagogue and he reads from the prophet Isaiah. The passage of scripture in Isaiah was basically the job description of the Messiah. This is what the Messiah would do when he came. Jesus read those verses and then said to, the congr to his people, his neighbors, uh, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And instead of embracing that, they uh, wanted to throw him off a cliff. And so... Uh, Jesus' very first sermon, he got death threats over. <laughs> you know, so, you know, every once in a while you got to say things people don't want to hear. Uh, and, and basically what he said in that was, the, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And so, you know, we work with the uh, poor. Um, I tell people, and this is not to be offensive to anyone in here, this is what I'm very, very proud about as a church, but I tell people God has placed me in... God has given me a low-income church in a high-income county. And, uh, and because we're, we're wanting to work with the poor, uh, the prisoner, he said that to release the, uh, the captive, the prison, and what we're doing in, in prisons right now uh, at, the, at the Davidson County Jail, where there's a couple guys that go most Thursdays, and then um, at the Riverbend on death row mainly, but in some of the other units at Riverbend, some of the things that we're doing are uh, just incredible. Um, and so, you know, that's why we do what we do. Uh, so he has called me, uh, he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to release, uh, to set the captive free, uh, to make the blind see. And so that's health care to me. And um, I wrote an article, an editorial a couple weeks ago about health care and our need to expand Medicaid and from a biblical perspective. Uh, tomorrow I'm going down to the Tennessee Justice Center for something on, on that. Uh, so pray about that. Um, and, uh, but, you know, praying for people to get well or, and healing people as well, but also fighting just for the need uh, for affordable health care for everyone. Uh, shouldn't have to bankrupt people when they, uh, when they uh, have their, these different sicknesses. And so uh, that, that's part of that. Um, and then he goes on to say to deliver the oppressed. And so we've talked about oppression and demon possession and prayers of deliverance and then to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So that's the not yet of the kingdom. Christ is returning. Matthew 25, that particular passage is Jesus' parable of the sheep and the goats, which has had a profound effect on me in, in recent years, the last several years, because Jesus at the very end of it basically says, this is the difference between heaven and hell. You know, if you're a sheep, you go to heaven. If you're a goat, you go to hell. And here's what it's about. And then he lists these things, right? He lists these things. Visiting the sick, visiting the prisoner, welcoming the immigrant. Uh, clothing the naked, um, feeding the hungry. And you've done this to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Enter into your eternal rest. And if you did not do these things, then there's damnation uh, for you. And so, you know, the programs that we do have as a church are trying to align with this is what it means to follow Christ. What are we doing with uh, when it comes to, in our own city, when it comes to homelessness and and uh, uh, immigrants, uh, which, by the way, a new law went to effect January 1 that could affect uh, our, uh, our Hispanic population mainly. Uh, Luis and I have had some meetings with both the sheriff and the police department. We're trying to set up some more meetings because now the law has gone to effect. What effect does that have on the, on the immigrants in our community? And so, uh, and so um, you know, pray about that. Uh, and again, mass incarceration, prison reform, all those things are part of what it means to, of sharing the gospel and preaching the gospel uh, there. And so 
You see, after that, uh, this little sentence about us. Um, at FCC, this is somewhat new, and I was explaining our church to someone, in, a missionary in Honduras like this past summer. I said this, and upon further reflection, I thought, that was really good. I want to keep that. And, uh, you know, every once in a while, I listen to what I say. Um, but at FCC, we see ourselves as a ministry that does church on Sundays. You know, it's what we do Monday through Saturday. Um, that is uh, what our church is about. And then we just come together for church on Sundays. So we, are, we see ourselves as a ministry that does church on Sundays instead of a church that does ministry during the week. We also believe it is important for us to serve as a conscience for our community. That, so we speak up on these things. Um, again, um, just this past week, you know, a, a reporter from the Tennessean doing a big story about homelessness in Middle Tennessee. And um, she contacted me because she said anytime she talks to anybody in Franklin about homeless, they say you need to talk to Pastor Kevin. Um, and I don't say that again, it's to God be the glory, but that's part of being the conscious, the social conscious. Um, you know, somebody from the city, get this, and this is something to pray about. Somebody who works in the city administration contacted me um, because they heard that, um, you know, I, I don't have my warehouse this winter for the emergency shelter that we've had. Um, the people moved out and the new tenants um, aren't, aren't too keen on, on me doing that. Um, and so I don't have a place for the homeless when it gets really, really cold. Uh, so you can pray about that. And somebody who, a city administrator, heard about that and contacted me and says, I think you should use this room at City Hall for that. And I'm, like, I'm like, what? Now, we're nowhere near there. There's so many hoops to jump through. But I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. Somebody from the city said that we could use this room at City Hall. That would be ideal. And so, uh, and so you know, there's, hopefully we'll have some more meetings. This, you know, it may not happen until next winter. <laughs> But the fact that somebody from the city even suggested that uh, was, uh, man, that's a miracle, um, you know, uh, for that. There's a group, uh, there's a, a, a group of ladies who has a ministry who, who contacted me in community housing, and they said, we want to open up a women's group home. So I'm thinking, man, let me off the hook. You guys do that. I'll go work on a homeless shelter. Um, and so that may, that's, you know, we've tried to get a women's group home going, and we run into the uh, to different roadblocks uh, from time to time, but with that group coming up saying they want to do it, um, and the kind of same way we did through community housing partnership, um, I was like, man, this is, <laughs> this is great. It'd be better if ladies ran the ladies group home anyway, and uh, I'll turn to uh, uh, this trying to get a permanent shelter uh, from that. So uh, pray about that, but um, the fuller story, um, man, the things God has done uh, there, I, I can't even begin to tell you uh, how he has moved on hearts uh, of the people. Um, I've gotten permission from the city to say this at MOK Day, so I'm going to go ahead and say it here. Uh, you know, the, the fuller story is the idea of putting these four markers around um, the Confederate monument down uh, in, in the square that kind of highlight more the African American experience through the Civil War, tell that side of the story. Uh, the, a fuller story. And of course that's in court because the Daughters of the Confederacy uh, are saying that's their property and so who knows when that'll all be resolved. Um, uh, and then uh, to have a statue of a United States Colored Troop soldier uh, placed somewhere downtown. And um, um, you know the United States Colored Troop were, they were, a lot of them were freed slaves, over 300 Williamson County slaves, either free or escaped, joined the United States Colored Troop, and so they actually fought for their own freedom, right? And died and, and all of that. Um, and so a statue representing the United States Colored Troops. And then it became, well, where are we gonna put that? Because we assumed that would be highly controversial <laughs> to put a statue of an African-American person anywhere in downtown Franklin would be highly controversial. Um, and, uh, and so we pitched a few ideas and Boy, you can see city leaders' face, you know, uh, turn white. Uh, they were already white, but turn white. Um, and, uh, and then we had this idea to place it somewhere. And I thought, there's no way it can be placed there. There's no way they're going to let us place that there. <laughs> so we started throwing that idea. And... Uh, I can remember meeting with the city leaders and saying, this is what we're thinking about the statue. 
expecting them to say no. And to date, everybody has agreed that's the place for it. And it's in front of the old courthouse at the square. In Franklin, across from the monument. You've got to be kidding me. We thought these other places, and because there's no way there, but that's where God's favor. And so, if you're ever at the courthouse uh, in downtown Franklin, there's a, a marker uh, out front already in the in the grass, kind of near um, uh, what's the what's the pizza place, Mellow Mushroom. Uh, you'll see a, a Civil War marker, and we've gotten permission to move that marker, and a statue and a marker will go. Uh, right there, a prominent place. Uh, and, uh, and one of the aldermen who we thought would be against us said at the very beginning that the statue needed to go in a place of equal nobility as CHIP is what they call the Confederate monument. And so that's, so one of these days, one of these days, soon, because now what's gonna happen is we thought we would do the marker first because that would kind of be not as controversial and then the statue would come later, right? And, but the, the markers aren't going up anytime soon because of the lawsuit, so the statue may go up first uh, from that. But, but one of these days, soon, hopefully in the next year and a half, you'll walk downtown Franklin and on the square uh, will be a statue of an African-American soldier. On the square. In the heart of where the Civil War was fought. And you say, what's that got to do with the gospel? Well. There's a stronghold in Franklin called racism. And if you don't believe that's a stronghold, let me, I'll tell you some stories. You remember a year or so ago when I had a rough week and you guys prayed for me, you know, because of some things I said um, and it, phew, uh, the hate that came out from that. There's a stronghold in our city that we believe as ministers, if the churches will come together and do this, It'll break that stronghold that's of racism that's been infected in our city since uh, before uh, the Civil War. And so there's a spiritual component uh, to this, and the churches are the ones who are to lead the charge. And so our church is involved in that. Um, you know, when it comes to being, again, when it comes to being the conscience of, this, of, this, of our community, when the, uh, when the government officials will contact us and, and uh, say, hey, we got this going on, or the, or the police chief will call and say, hey, Kevin, this is what I hear is going on in the community. What can you, you know, how can we help, or how can you help us? Um, uh, you know, tomorrow in the Tennessee, and there's an editorial that I wrote about the death penalty uh, on, online. It's not going to be on the hard, in the paper paper, I think, until Wednesday, but online uh, uh, tomorrow to speak out against uh, our state, all of a sudden deciding to, uh, you know, the next two years, there's six men who are all friends of mine, so friends of our church, uh, who are scheduled to be executed. Um, KB's not one of them, but it's only a matter of time if it doesn't stop, you see. Um, and, um, and so speaking out on those things. But the challenge is, okay, it's time for you guys to do that as well. You know, uh, as this is how, as a church, we serve our community and share the love of Christ. Uh, by standing up when we see uh, injustices going uh, a certain way. And when people ask us why we're doing this, it's because, well, because you see, the way we serve a God that we cannot see is by serving those we can't see. And so I'm doing this because this is how I serve God. And let me tell you about who, who I think Christ is, because what he's done for me, uh, he can do for you uh, as well. And so it's not one or the other, it's, it's both. It's all the gospel. And as a church, we're to be living out the gospel. And that living out the gospel is what we do Monday through Saturday, uh, not just um, what we do here. Now, you can all live out the gospel here in a minute by helping us tear down. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know we, gotta, we gotta put everything up because school starts tomorrow. That was a cheap shot, wasn't it, Lord? <laughs> you know, but, uh, but anyway, so if I, if I would say, 2018 was a challenging year on many levels for our church and for a lot of people in this church um, who have told me, you know, they're glad 2018 is over, 2019. Uh, but God is still on his throne, and I'm, I'm optimistic that 2019 will be a breakthrough year for us on a number of, 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 uh, of levels. There's some challenges out there, um, 
and uh, you know, there, like there always is. But the challenge now for all of us in, is to get more involved in what it means to live out the gospel um, and uh, encourage people to grow in their relationship with Christ. And if you know people who need really what we have here, please tell them, look, I got, we got a church that everything you've told me about uh, that you're looking for, or what our, that's what our church is. So just come and, uh, uh, and experience it. It won't be like anything you've experienced. We sing, we have communion, those kind of things. But there's just something unique and something different, I think, about what happens here on Sunday mornings at, uh, at 10 a.m. or 10.10, 10, whenever we decide to... Uh, whenever we decide to start five minutes after the countdown we're really good about starting right after the countdown is over with but when the countdown starts that's that's anybody's guess all right i'm rambling now so um here's our our prayer for the week or for the year um jude chapter 24 and as i was praying about god what prayer can we use this year last year was the lord's prayer this verse came to mind because this is all about our salvation in this one verse you have salvation in all of its aspects, from justification to sanctification to glorification. How God has saved us, he, wants, he, he gives us through His Spirit the power to live, and then one day we'll be with Him uh, forever. And so all aspects of uh, salvation are seen in this prayer. And so it's Jude's prayer. Jude was the brother of Jesus, and so this is Jude's prayer at the end of his, at the end of his book. And so let's stand together and let's say this uh, prayer as our dismissal. All right? Say this with me. To him who is able to keep from you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before, before all ages, now and forever. Amen. Let's say that again. All right, you guys were stumbling with me, so let's say it again. All right. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. You're dismissed.